Who created the universe? I have questions, and Logan Stephen Kane has answers. You're listening to Cornfield Theology. <laughs> Church located in Des Moines Metro, back at you with another Cornfield Theology podcast. And once again, my counterpart, my friend, intern at Redemption Hill, Logan Stephen Kane, is here to uh, walk us through. Logan, who created the universe? You got answers? Well, I, uh, yeah, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit was involved too. This is a Trinitarian <laughs> act. So that is our what podcast kind of episode. We can wrap it up now and go on home. Mm hmm. Uh, um, part of the, part of the reason for this particular podcast, Logan, as you know, and just telling others is that we're going through the book of Genesis and a while back you said, Hey, let's just do podcasts that really, uh, map on to our sermon series. And so that's what we're doing today. We've already done one podcast on just kind of walking through some things in Genesis. I'm um, looking forward to doing some more. You know what I'm really looking forward to? I really want to do a podcast that supplements our, our, uh, uh, conversation in Genesis six versus one to three, one to four. Okay. You know, like what do we do with that? What do we do with the gods of men coming into the daughters of of man mm -hmm. and them having sex, right? And then right. Nephilim yeah. allegedly. And it's I mean, we, I, I kind of so. think of the Nephilim as basically the Dunadine from Lord of the Rings. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, why not? Well you These thought the men through. that live longer, have stronger, better, faster. Well, we're going to get into that. That's going to be fun because <laughs> there's a lot of opinions on that. I, I do I, approach I do it from a, there's a divine, a divine rebellion taking place mm. again, like we have in Genesis three, but we'll get there down the road here. But right now we're still in Genesis one. We're actually wrapping up Genesis one. I did get into Genesis two last week on the seventh day of creation where mm. for this Sunday, not that, you know, by the time this recording comes out. You know, we'll be past it, but we're doing one more sermon on Genesis 1 and then really getting into Genesis 2, Genesis 3, and right down the road. So taking our time as we go through it, really wanted to ask really good questions. And so one of the questions we're going to ask is like, okay, when it comes to the creation of the universe, what's an intelligent way to think about that? Did it, see what I did there? Yeah, right. We're talking about intelligent design. Intelligent yeah, it's ID. Design. You're so clever, Sean. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. It's the best compliment you've given me in a long time. So, intelligent design. Um, there's this. Let's back up here. There's a couple ways to approach uh, the creation of the universe, why we exist. Mm -hmm. and we're not talking ontological questions, metaphysical questions. It, it does bleed into that for sure. Uh, we're backing up and asking questions like, "What's a good approach?" You have theistic evolution. You have evolution. Mm -hmm. Those those things exist. Um, right. Evolution is your classic Darwinian evolution that you're going to learn about in the public schools. Theistic evolution is like, how do we bring in God and evolution and kind of marry those two things together, which is really popular but in liberal Christianity, frankly. Uh, it's a view that I do reject the most part out of hand, just like I don't agree, period. Um, you have creationism. You're a hardcore creationist. Um, you have the Creation Museum in Ohio, right, uh, which is very popular. And I uh, look forward to going there someday with my kids and, and walking through that. I heard it's very good. And then we have this other camp that's intelligent design. And so um, it's, a, it's a, the way I look at it, Logan, and you, then I'll let you give me your thoughts. It, it's not like uh, intelligent design in this particular perspective is against creationism per se, but mm -hmm. it's approaching the question from a different angle. It's a different entry right. point into asking and, and discovering the answer to the question who created or what created the universe right yeah i mean so i feel like creationism like it's coming from it from a you know perspective of of trying to establish that of course god created the universe whereas i feel like right. intelligent design is almost the opposite where you're looking at the universe and creation and you're using that and it's fine tuning and other uh mm -hmm. other specifics as a way and to argue for god's existence um, both are of course going to be against kind of argue against the standard evolution, uh, perspective yep. and they're useful. Um, I think intelligent design maybe leaves a little bit more like wheel room in like age of earth stuff that we've talked about previously. 
Um, I could be wrong on that, but I tend to see like creationists as being a typical like 6,000 to 10,000 years old, whereas intelligent design tends to give a little bit more leeway uh, depending on the arguments within it. Yeah, and I think the point that we're going to make is like we're not here to argue against creationism per se. Um, we're actually mm -hmm. here to argue a different approach uh, or at least talk about a different approach against evolution. Mm -hmm. So if yeah. we're going to use the word evolution, can you at least help define what we mean when we use that word? Yeah, so the evolution, it's a, it's a theory uh, about how organisms have evolved through natural processes. Can we pause essentially for a positive trait. Yeah. It's a, it's a theory that's getting treated as fact. I think, yeah. I think it's fair to say, like, you send your kids to public school, it's like you, your kid comes out an evolutionist on the whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, so go ahead. yeah, I would agree that it's a theory. Um, I would encourage Christians to actually really look at it and see all the argumentations with it um, because it's not like a theory that was pulled out of thin air. There is a lot of evidence and argumentation that is used to support it. So I would just be very careful of just immediately dismissing it. Um, yeah, it's 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 kind of I kind of look at it like this. It's like um, when I hear when I hear someone use Christian words and terminology, I'm always kind of like, okay, anyone can use the same words that I use. What do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. And so when I think about evolution, I'm kind of like, okay, what do you mean by that? And there are certain aspects of uh, Darwinian theistic or sorry Darwinian evolution that I just say no. Um, yeah, for many reasons. And there are other mm -hmm. aspects of it where I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Like macroevolution versus microevolution. That'd be the big, sure. you know, talking. Yeah. And when I'm okay, macroevolution makes sense to me. Micro or sorry, how's it go? Opposite. <laughs> yeah. The opposite micro. Yes. Macro. No, I didn't. A man didn't come from an ape. Moth right. changed due to its environment so that it can adapt and survive. Sure. The color, the color of the moth. Sure. Yeah. 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 So the full definition is like organisms have evolved through natural selection. So um, there will be like some sort of positive trait um, that is developed through random mutation that helps that organism survive. And it because it survives, it then breeds and is able to pass that genetic mutation down. And through these gradual mutations, it is argued then that different species develop. Um, and we know mutations, of course, like one thing in support of it, we know mutations happen. Like we can see that actually in our time, there are people born with extra fingers. That's like a mutation, whether or not it's going to be helpful in the long run. You know, that's what natural selection decides essentially. Good. And then, so when we, when, when, when I say, Hey, let's approach this from an intelligent design perspective. Um, how would you begin to define that for people? Yeah. So intelligent design, there's. There's like a, an older version of intelligent design and like a newer, newer version of intelligent design. When I was doing like my research for this podcast, it is oftentimes, uh, the original version is the watchmaker argument. It's one that I'm sure a lot of people yeah. are aware of, and it is an argument that is based off of a strong inference rather than just facts. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's the idea of the watchmaker argument is kind of like a parable, right? Like, so you're in the woods traveling, hiking, whatever, and you find a watch on the ground and you pick it up, take it apart and look at the intricate design mm -hmm. of the watch. And the natural inference that you make is that this complex device had to have a watchmaker. In the same way, we look at the world and the universe and see how it is far more complex than watch. Right. And it seems to infer a world maker, just like there is a watchmaker. Right. So that is like the older um, version of intelligent design that I found. Yep. Um, I have found that it has gone a little bit out of vogue because of the rise of evolution as an alternative means to dis uh, to explain how that complexity comes about. And it seems like the uh, the the um, older Intelligent design, it's been around for a while. I mean, I, mean, I remember, I remember I was in college and that being a, a particular, uh, argument that was being made. Mm -hmm. I, I remember very specifically, I mean, not that college for me was that long ago, you know, 2007 or whatever, but mm -hmm. it's been around for a while. It's, it's your, it's your classic argument, but I, I do think intelligent design has grown. Yeah. Excuse me. He's has dying. grown immature, immature, I'm dying, 
has grown and matured and, and to be more uh, diverse in its argumentation. Yeah. Uh, more robust. Yeah. Good word. Ro more robust for sure. And it, you know, when I said earlier that it, it approaches the, um, it's approach to, uh, as opposed to creation is a little bit different. I think with creationism, there are presuppositions in place, right? Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I'll get rid of those accordions. There are presuppositions that are in place and those presuppositions are based upon scripture, right? Mm -hmm. This is what scripture says. And this is what we see. All this comes to has, has come together in terms of creation. Mm -hmm. And you, even when you get into like our encounter as well, which is popular in Ohio, again, there's a presupposition in place and I'm not against that. I actually think it's a fine way to approach it. We are, you and I are scripture first people. Yeah. Right. Everyone that comes to the question of how did the universe come about comes with some sort of presupposition. The yeah. Christian is of course going to come with the belief in God already. And so when they look at the world, they think, well, yeah, God made it versus an atheist already presumes that God doesn't exist. And now they will try to answer the question without ever bringing that into focus. And, and what I would say with the Christian, it's like, we acknowledge our presupposition. <laughs> We're like, yeah, we, we should admit. at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, yep, exactly. So it's like, yeah, you guys are pre 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 assuming things. Like, yep. I'm hopefully Christian. Everyone being, else. Yeah, at least we're being honest about it. It's like it's like the news. Like when I hear news agencies, it's like you know we're fair and balanced. You know we don't we don't take a side or whatever. It's like sh stop it. Just admit your biases and just let's move right. on with our life. You know. So like I don't care if MSNBC, Fox, CNN, y'all got biases. So just knock it off. Same thing when you kind of approach creation. It's like, okay, we got biases, we got presuppositions. Let's just admit it and move on with our lives. Uh, intelligent design is going to have a different approach. It's, um, of course, like you said, Logan, rightly, it's like we all all approaches are going to have some biases or presuppositions for sure. But the approach is very different, very different. Um, intelligent design is going to first uh, make its argument from science. It's not even it's not even saying who created the world yet. Like when you pull mm -hmm. on the thread of intelligent design, it's just trying to get you first to let's admit that something created the world, right? Or or something theistic created something outside of the universe created the world, right? It wants you to get it wants to get you to that point, and then it from a Christian becomes the conclusion rather yeah. than the presupposition. Yeah. Yeah. And so eventually, you know, the Christian, um, ID person is going to basically say, it's going to lead you to, you know, the God of the Bible, but let's get you to first admit that something outside of this universe created everything. Right. Uh, and we talked about how the intelligent design, uh, argument has gotten more robust and mm -hmm. the way it does that, you know, we used previously the analogy of the watch and its complexities. Mm -hmm. Well, the way the intelligent design has gotten more robust is it starts looking at the complexities and the specificity of the universe and how it was, um, you know, we would argue created things that, you know, I've found in my research and you can comment and share stuff is there are certain constants in the universe that are extremely precise that if they were off by a fraction, it would actually make it so it would be impossible for the universe to support life. These constants that I found were the electric magnetic uh, interaction constant, the gravitational constant. There is mm -hmm. the weak force and strong force, which is going into like the atoms and how it's how the different protons, electrons, and neutrons are bound together. I believe mm -hmm. so. Open to corrections because it's been a long time since yeah, I've yeah. actually studied science. Well, let's do this. Um, let's do this um, real quick. Let me just mention a few things. The, one of the leading institutions for intelligence, intelligent design is the Discovery mm -hmm. Institute, which I believe is in Seattle, uh, Washington. And if you're thinking to yourself, okay, what are some of the main proponents of ID? You're talking about uh, William Dembski, Michael Behe, uh, Jonathan Wells, and, and Stephen Meyer. Um, these are particular individuals who who have studied a lot on intelligent design, have written a lot on uh, on intelligent design. And so maybe let's do this. Um, talk about the six different, got this from the Discovery Institute website. You can find it there. Six reasons for ID, because you're actually getting into them right now, but let's walk through them systematically. Six reasons why I believe intelligent design is a good 
a forward to thinking about mm. the creation of the universe. And the first one is, and Logan and I were talking before, you know, kind of press, press the record button is the Kalam argument. That's the origin of the universe argument. Um, mm. the famous Kalam cosmological argument is the three part argument that the universe requires a first cause. And so here are the, here are the, here are the statements, right? Anything that begins to exist has a cause. That'd be statement number one or statement number two, the universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a first cause. Logan, what do you think about that particular approach? One of six approaches to the intelligent, intelligent design. Yeah, I definitely see the Kalam cosmological argument as like its own arguments. I was actually kind of surprised to see this as part of the intelligent design. Um, but it is a good argument. It has been worked on and expanded on by William Lane Craig. Yeah. Um, and yeah. he's defended each of the these points. Um one thing that is, I think, important in his argumentation is he goes on from the first cause um, to because, like saying that there's a first cause doesn't necessarily mean that that's some sort of divine being. It just means it's some sort of first cause. Um, but he goes on to argue things like that, you know, the immensity of the universe requires basically omnipotence, like immense amount of power. Um, it would require uh omniscience with the vast amount of knowledge to make it work um and so you there's additional steps after it to take to get to a divine creator um but i think it is a very strong argument and i i think the most important part is the anything that begins to exist has a cause because some people will go on and argue well like well what created god well he never began right. to exist so he doesn't have a cause that's why at the conclusion of it, it talks about the first cause or it's basically an uncaused causer. I really like the argument. Um, and there is some robust debates on the Kalam cosmological argument. Oh, yeah. I've seen some really good resources by William Lane Craig on that. And even, you know, the Kalam argument tends to be a little more philosophical, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to scientific, which we'll get into some scientific reasons here in a moment. What I like about the Kalam argument is that it does lead one to, okay, what is the thing or the person, the deity that is the first cause that created the first, you know, uh, right. cause you have to have that in place. That's the assumption it's leading you to. All right. Here's the second one. The fine tuning of the universe. You had already get, got into this, um, and this mm. would be reason number two for intelligent design. Consider some of the finely tuned factors that make up our that make our universe possible. And you already mentioned this. If the strong nuclear force were slightly more powerful, then there would be no hydrogen, an essential element of life. If mm -hmm. it was slightly weaker, then hydrogen would would be the only element in existence. Uh, if the weak nuclear force were slightly different, then either there would there would not be enough uh, helium to generate uh, heavy elements in the stars or stars would burn out uh, too quickly and supernova explosions could not scatter heavily uh, heavy elements across the universe you know and there's other arguments that that go into the fine-tuning argument mm -hmm. yeah i think um if you go to the discovery institute where it starts breaking these down it starts going like into ratios yeah um yes. So it's like the following gives a sense of the degree of fine tuning that must go into some of these values to yield life, uh, life friendly universe. And it's like the gravitational constant is like one part in 10 to the power of 34. Um, I, the entropy in, I don't even know what this is. Initial entropy, one part in 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 123. Um, just like going into like the probability and specificity of these different constants. In my own research, and this is going to be coming from Reasonable Faith by William Lane Craig, because he, he's like the main mm -hmm. guy I studied when I was doing apologetics. Um, yeah, yeah. One of the people he was quoting was an Oxford physicist, Roger Henrose, who calculated that the odds of a, a special low entropy conditioning having arisen really by chance in the absence of any constraining principles is at least as small as about one part in 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 123 in order for the universe to exist like it is such a small chance for it yeah. to even be possible 
So for all you people out there like me who don't like numbers, and you, you kind of look at the, the statistics and the data points, you're kind of like, huh? One in, one in a, a thousand? A lot of me. zeros. A lot of zeros. Like, what, what do you do with that? I don't understand. Like, let me, I'll, I'll break it down into like second grade math mm -hmm. for you, okay? Because I need second grade math in order to figure this out. And sure. I'm not even going to use many numbers. If, if the Earth were to move its axis over ever so slightly, it one way or the other acts like how it rotates and you know mm -hmm. in, in relationship to the sun if it moves its axis ever so slightly one way or the other we're either going to burn up or freeze mm -hmm. the, the the earth is so uh fine tuned by a design that it is allowing for us to exist on a planet that has seasons that does not burn up um does not freeze so I just summed up all the numbers with that particular example. Um, I would want to give an example for those for more math. <laughs> for, yeah, you know, if you think about, smarter if you think than about, me. <laughs> well, if you think about like baking, right? So a half a cup is one divided by two, right? So that's half. Um, I my or if you say know. like, oh, I have a 50-50 chance of succeeding at whatever task. You, you know, that's one divided by two. Like some of these numbers that we're talking about is not one divided by two. It's one divided by like a couple million. So it's one with a lot of zeros after it. A lot of zeros. Um, like, yeah, it's an insane amount of low probability. There was and a so math. The arg go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Nope, go. All right. I was going to say like it, it is such a low probability that this is why the inference is made then that there must have been some sort of designer to put these constants in place because the probability of it ever happening is so low that it goes to the point of just not just Im improbability but impossibility yeah there's a mathematician i can't remember his name but i read his book man i wish i had his name maybe it'll come to me here in a minute i must have read his book five six seven eight nine ten years ago i don't know mm -hmm. But he was making the argument, like statistically speaking, um, the chances of the universe being created through evolution is so much greater than the conclusion of intelligent design, which is there was a something outside the universe. And so even he was using statistics to be to basically say this wasn't evolution, guys. Um, from from yeah, some some people say math is the purest science, and so. Um, if one would hold that conclusion, um, he's basically saying from the most pure science, we can say mathematically speaking that there was something outside of the universe, which created the universe. So even using, using math in that way, um, that argument was being made. And one thing I want to highlight, just cause we were speak previously speaking about, uh, presuppositions. Um, this is where those can kind of sneak in, um, from atheists where it's like, if you already don't believe that there could even be a possibility of a God or a spiritual realm uh, that kind of conclusion can just be sort of dismissed out of hand. But I think the evidence is strong enough that it kind of points to that. Like you would essentially be deceiving yourself at that point to just dismiss these, this sort of information. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned the guy. Yeah, it is William Demps Dembski. It looks like I thought it was somebody else, but he'd be the mathematician, but I've read of his, some of his books on intelligent design and powers. I, I don't know if you knew this, Logan. When I was in seminary, they offered a um, a summer class mm -hmm. on intelligent design and Darwinism. So it was one of those classes where it was two weeks. You show up for three hours, Monday to Friday, and it's just mm -hmm. like this, you know, in, um, information dump right. um, on you. And uh, it was great. That was my first entrance into thinking about intelligent design, and uh, it was wonderful. Was that's this one of your of... liberal schools or one of your more conservative schools? Well, that's a good conservative... question. Yeah, people get confused when they look at my CV. They're like, I don't know what to make of you, man. I mean, one of the more, <laughs> it was more conservative then, though it's gone a little woke these days. So, depending on circa 2007 or you know, circa 2024. <laughs> and I'll leave it at that. All right. Uh, that was argument number two for intelligent design. Mm -hmm. Argument number three, the origins of information in DNA and the origin of life. Uh, basically, the laws of the universe 
are necessary for life to exist. Again, just taking this from the Discovery Institute. But they aren't. They are not sufficient to explain how life arose. The origin of life requires a massive infusion of information, which can only be explained by intelligent design. And I think this gets to the mathematical thing as well, which is like when you look at DNA, it is so complex. There is mm -hmm. so much information. It's like how could that have possibly evolved into what what we know what it is today? Well, and not only that, like. So evolution requires mutations in DNA. That is what evolution is. Right. But then where did the DNA come from? Where did it first start? How did life spring from non-life? Mm -hmm. Which I think is a very difficult question to answer. Um, I'm sure right. there are some answers out there, um, but I'm sure they would also bring up even more questions. Yeah, you just no, don't... I agree. You just don't see life blooming from nothing. <laughs> like it's not even observable in today's time. Yeah. And I, and I'm thinking to myself and I'm just maybe my head's in Genesis and you know, Genesis one, one, but, um, mm -hmm. look at humanity and we look at the abilities of humanity and how much it, it maps onto God himself. For, for example, this gets kind of back to the watchmaker thing. God created, right? He, he existed, he created, we're creators as well. And, and, and in order for something to exist, we, there needs to be something like, uh, I think of my kids, right? When they were little, they love Legos, you know, back in the day, those are the days when they played with magnet tiles and, you know, things were so simple those days. Listen, now you I just need to get them Legos now. They would still uh, do it. They you can. Get but one of them on, there's drive. a Rivendale, there's a Rivendale Lego set that's coming out from Lord of the Rings Ooh. and it looks amazing. Oh, they might be able to get behind that because they love Lord of the Rings. Oh, I might, I might be able to get them back into Legos. But, but those were the days like they created, they created something, their imagination. Mm. Um, they like, I don't know how they did it. I can't remember what it was like to be a kid. I don't know if they had like, this is what I have in my mind and now I must create or they created along the way. Whatever the case it might be, one thing that has to be said uh, it took their creative ability in order to make the Lego thing. You know what I'm saying? So I just think there had to been, you know, a creator of some sorts that that is before the creation itself. And then and the intricacies like of DNA help point to that. Mm -hmm. All right, here's another one. Uh, for the origin of irreducible complex uh, molecule machines. Uh, I think the one, mm -hmm. the individual who made this popular or brought it to my attention was a guy by the name of Michael Behe. And uh, basically, molecular machines are another compelling line of, of evidence for intelligent design. There is, a known, there is no known cause other than intelligent design that can produce machine-like structures with multiple interacting parts. That makes sense? Yeah, um, it's uh, basically an argument of um, that there are, in the smallest organisms we have, like bacteria, there are processes that are taking two, three, four parts in order to execute. And the removal of even one of those parts would just destroy the whole process. Yeah. It just would not function. And so from evolution, which is very small changes over time, it can't explain how these complex machines would have developed if it's supposed to be incremental because these sort of things would have been like, you would have created like part of the machine for no reason, essentially through, through the random mutations. Um, and since it doesn't help it sur to survive, how would that continue on? That sort of thing. Um, that's at least my understanding. Does that map on to your understanding? Yeah. I mean, in about two hours, three hours, I'm about to work on my automobile, my Honda. And um, mm -hmm. I have to you know fix the back brakes, basically new drums, new pads. And uh, it takes all the parts in order for those brakes to work, right? And you get rid of one of those parts, you take out the drum or whatever, um, it's going to break down. And so it's kind of the same argument when it comes to um, irreducible complexity. You have something that's so complex, like you say, and you take out one of those parts, then it ceases to, it ceases to work. And so how do you explain the complexity, even, even, even the, the simplest of of molecules like you put them under a microscope from what i understand from michael behe 
the simplest of, of, mm-hmm. of molecules. It, it is so it is still so complex. Um, you cannot explain the existence of it without a designer. And so I find that to be a pretty, pretty strong, again, it goes back to the DNA argument as well. It's like, how, where all this information come from? Like, how did I get there? Like, could it just evolve that way? I mean, it take let me say it differently. It takes faith to believe that evolution is how all this came about. Talk about exerting an immense amount of faith. It takes a ton of faith. I'm sorry. It just does. And so I, I, I quibble when, when the evolutionist is like, ah, oh, it's just faith that leads you to your conclusions. I'm like, well, same to you, buddy. Um, I did find um, the Institute, this really good sort of summation of the irreducible yeah. complexity. It says by irreducible, com- uh, irreducibly complex, I mean the single system, which is composed of several interacting parts that contribute to a basic function and where the removal of any one of these parts causes the system to effectively cease functioning. How can that system develop mm-hmm. incrementally over time? when it just doesn't function yep. without yep. all of its parts. I would agree. It takes a ton of faith. faith. So that's, I, I find that to be compelling. It's probably one of the more compelling ones for me personally of, of the list. Um, and it's yeah. fascinating. Like if you like go in and see like all these different parts, cause it's not just like one thing that we're pointing to. Like there's multiple different functions that cells and bacteria do that need multiple parts in order to function. And Studying that sort of biology is just And maybe there's a good point to say, um, we need more Christian scientists. We need more Christian biologists. Um, and, and I think part of like intelligent design can help foster that, that can help, can help foster, uh, Christians be like, well, whoa, uh, let's see how God created the world. Let's see the complexity of it and see the beauty of it. it that was the original motivation yeah. of scientists was trying to understand one what God thousand has created. percent. And, and it is sad to see how Christians and Christianity has, has given up, given up on the science, on the sciences, given up on the arts too, which is the, another discussion, right? Like when you look back at history and you look at the history of Western civilization and, you know, I'm big into classical education, so I'm, I'm steeped in this, uh, you, you see the, um, massive contribution of Christianity by Christianity when it comes to the science. And as you said, Logan, and rightly, it's like, they look at the universe and say, oh, man, God created this. Let's learn more. Um, it was a curious attitude, not this skeptical attitude that one must have when they think about evolution. Evolution, Darwinian evolution, and I would even argue theistic evolution, comes with the presupposition of skepticism. I'm not a fan of skepticism as a general rule. Uh, but I think a, more, a better approach is let's be curious. Uh, curiosity can lead us into many wonderful directions to learn about the one who created all this. I think that brings us to yep, step number five, five, the origin of animals. Um, in his book, mm-hmm. Darwin's doubts, Darwin's doubt, excuse me, Stephen Meyer considers the nature of animals and what is requ- required to build an animal. He finds that only intelligent design can explain the abrupt origin of animal life in the fossil record, which is debated adamantly, right? as well as the new information required to build Mm -hmm. an intelligent nature of parts and systems that comprise animal body plans. When you get into the fossil records, man, there are, there are heated debates, um, you know, because at this point you're talking about, what do you do with the flood? Right. Did, did the Mm -hmm. flood, you know, kind of, I'm, I'm using layman's terms now. Did the flood kind of like compress things in such a way that made fossilization um, appear to be older than what it is? You know, if you're taking a purely um, Darwinian evolutionistic approach, you know, you're looking at the fossil record and you're like, this thing's been around for millions of years. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, you, if you're a Christian and you believe that, then you're you're in this old earth cat, which then is another debate. So when it comes to the fossil record, Logan, how do you approach that one? Because I, I think you're a contrarian here. Not a contrarian. You have uh, a perspective that some Christians would not hold, which I have perspectives that many Christians don't hold too. But Yeah. I mean, so like we discussed in our on our previous podcast, like I yeah. actually hold to an old earth kind of position. Uh, and one of our church members like challenged me on it and provided a lot of resources that I will admit yeah. haven't looked into too much. 
Um, but I do see fossil records as part of general revelation. Um, and I actually don't see too much issue with radio, uh, uranium, like radioactive decay dating and that sort of thing. So I, I tend to view existence of fossils as, as, as actually pointing to older earth. I think that this article does raise an interesting question of like, well, where did those creatures come from? Cause there is this like huge explosion of, of animals. Yeah. Within the false records. I haven't looked too deeply into it, so I don't want to speak too much out of ignorance. Um, I have heard arguments of like, you know, where is the different like gaps right. in the fossil records? Because, you know, there's the argument of the changing of species. I have some questions on that that I haven't looked into um, too much. Um, I also have questions of like two different species can't breed, you know, with each other. Like a can't a cat can't right. breed with a dog. That's the that sort of thing. So evolution are you thing. having these transitions? Right. How are you having these transitions from different species where they can actually continue to breed? Um, that sort of thing. So I don't turn up my nose to fossil records. Um, I, I actually view them as being part of general revelation um, rather than what they're yeah, saying yeah. or something. Yeah. I mean, there, there's a... Uh... Uh, so this is where I'm, um, man, a little more open-handed here. I, I do think you have to mm -hmm. account for the flood if you hold to a worldwide flood, mm -hmm. which, again, I don't want to re repeat our previous podcast. Sure. And you look at all the different trees where, where you see flood accounts, you know, different um, uh, people groups mm -hmm. that had different flood accounts. I think, I think there's strong evidence to suggest that there was a, a worldwide flood. That flood had to sure. do something you know, to everything that existed underneath that water. And um, so I, I think you have to account, like, what, what do we right. do with that? What you do with it is a different question, but you have to account for it, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, sure, I just don't see how a flood creates fossils because my understanding yeah. of fossils is, like, a creature dies, right, and it starts the decay process. But can the flood, um, can the flood, and then can the flood some... um, the, the the process, the fossil process? I mean, I guess you could make an argument with a worldwide flood that yeah. sediment and debris and stuff could cover the fossils once it lands. Um, and I know a lot of fossils are created through yeah. like volcanic eruptions and this sudden deposit right. of of sediment and volcanic ash that will help preserve. So there could be yeah. a possibility. Um, I think it takes a lot of th – there'd be assumptions with it, right? You know, because we we didn't observe the flood, so yeah. we're like, okay, worldwide flood. What are some possible implications of this amount, vast amount of water being put on the earth? So, so maybe 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 we'll put a pin in this one because we're, we'll get to the flood when we go through our mm -hmm. Genesis series, and we'll certainly want to revisit that on a podcast. And so, when maybe when our head is in that foley, we can um we can do the showdown. What did the flood do? I think it could be good, uh, if possible, to like the church member that oh, we'll bring more challenging on, on my more, uh, old Earth perspective. We should, yeah, okay. no, I know the guy. He'd be great. He would. He'd be awesome. Yeah, and then we could maybe yeah. meet in person for that one because I don't know if he has a no, camera and wants to do it online. Great. All right, let's go to number six. This will be the last uh, argument from the Discovery Institute for Intelligent Design: the origin of humans. You have the origin of animals. Now, obviously, you're gonna, if you can talk about animals, you can talk about humans. Uh, there are many aspects of humanity that point to intelligent design. Um, it is discussed in Science and Human Origins in that book. The human body plan appears abruptly in the fossil record, challenging an evolutionary explanation. Um, and here's a quote from uh, the book Science and Human Origins. And I quote, Homunian fossils, human fossils, generally fall into two groups, ape-like species and human-like species, with a large unbridged, unbridged gap, gap between, between them. Despite the hype promoted by evolutionary paleontologists, the fragmented Homunian fossil record does not uh, record does not document the evolution of human from ape-like precursors. End quote. So basically, he's saying there's a clear distinction between the two. You have your human-like fossils, right? Like, it, it's yeah, it's arguing exactly. about that gap. And so, I mean, again, I don't. I don't even macroevolution so i would say that's that's true but now he's just saying 
it's one thing to not believe something. Now here's the evidence in which you don't need to believe that. Right. Yeah, I do. I do find that fascinating, and I also hold to the microevolution that change mm -hmm. within a species for a specific mm -hmm. adaptation. Um, I think these gaps are very interesting to look into. Um, one thing I was just sort of thinking about since I have an older Earth kind of view, and there is this sudden appearance of humans within the fossil record. We like, oh, did God just create things progressively, uh, and then just decide to make humans eventually? So something for me to consider. Probably the best explanation I would have would be that if, since I hold to that older earth and I don't take Genesis one very literally. Yeah. And that's where we've talked before. Um, I, I take it much more literally than you would. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't view it as poetry. Um, it's not to say there's not an inclusio going on between Genesis one, one Genesis two, two. Yeah, but you can also see it as like the pre like preparation of the garden. So it's like two different views of the six yeah, days yeah. And, and you know, and Again, I'm a big fan of John Selhammer and his view of creation. So you if you don't know that name, um, read his book, Genesis Unbound. <laughs> Just plug yeah, in the previous exactly. podcast. Go, 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 go for okay, it. We'll, we'll stop. Just go to the previous podcast <laughs> and you'll get everything we're about to say right now. Yeah. Okay. So those mm -hmm. are the six six arguments for intelligent design. Um, as we wrap up, Logan, is there anything else you'd want to add to anything we haven't said that probably needs to be said? No, I think... I mean, I don't, I don't have anything to say that hasn't been said, but just a sort of summary of, I think intelligent design does have a robust criticism, uh, of, of the evolutionary theory. Actually, I yeah. do have something new to say. Uh, one thing, um, is there is of course critiques of intelligent design, even if you were yep. to accept it. Um, one of those critiques came from Immanuel Kant in his book, a uh, critique of pure reason. And that. The design argument and intelligent design argument establishes an architect of the world, um, but not necessarily a creator, actually. Basically saying, like, there could have been, and this is actually a view of some Christians of, like, the world or the universe mm -hmm. already existed in some capacity, and then God shaped it and formed it to be what it is now. Um, and then another criticism is that intelligent design doesn't necessarily get you yeah. to the Christian God. It gets you to some right. sort of designer. Um, and that's where other arguments and the right. scriptures come to bear. So on the first point with Manuel Kant, um, he, the, do mm -hmm. the doctrine he would be denying here is creation ex nihilo, uh, ex nihilo, meaning out of nothing Correct. in the Latin that, uh, God created out of nothing. He would be denying that particular doctrine. So that'd be the first point. Mm -hmm. And what was your second point there? So the second point was that the intelligent design uh, argument doesn't necessarily go yeah, to the Christian God. Right. It's, the conclusion is not necessarily the Christian God. It can be, it could be Allah. It could be um, even a host of like right. other gods. Um, and that's where the Bible has to come yep. to bear. And so that's where I said, oh, there's other that's where I that said at the beginning, be um, I use the word theism. Right. Mm -hmm. I didn't say like the God of the Bible. Right. Now I, I do think, do you think that the primary argument like evolution, Darwinian evolution from intelligent design is good. And it's leading us to a place where we must say yeah. everything was created by something outside of ourselves. There's something theistic or DT going on. And, outside but of I do creation. think that a good, a, a, per, a curious person who wants to walk this out will be led to the God of the Bible, the one true God. In terms of okay, if if something if a deity created everything, you gotta ask the next question is okay, who is that deity, right? You got you gotta mm -hmm. walk that out. And uh, if you if you're approaching intelligent design from a purely, um, you know, Darwinian perspective, and you you actually follow the thread, I do think you get to the guy, you know, the one who created the one true God, the one the God of the Bible. So, but you're right. Ultimately, it's just leading you away from Darwinian evolution to a different broader category of is it Allah is it Yahweh it, what are we talking about here um and then you kind of continue to walk that out like okay what does the Christian scripture say about about uh, the creation so that's a good point um that's good I think that's just a primer we're, we're doing these podcasts as a reminder as a supplement to our teaching series through the book of Genesis 
And uh, we're not covering all the bases, of course. We couldn't do that. We're not that smart. But we love the wet appetites, right? We love to bring up questions and um, like the, I keep using the word curious. Be curious. I think that's a good thing. And when we talk about creation of the world and the, the world that you exist in, be curious about, you know, why, does that, why is that tree there? Why is that mountain range there? Um, enjoy, mm -hmm. enjoy the tree, by the way. Enjoy the beauty. Enjoy the, enjoy the beauty of the mountain range as well. And uh, as Christians, we're thankful for all that God gives. And that kind of plays into um, just this idea of, okay, why? Why did God do it that way? You know, so uh, be curious. I think that's a good thing. Intelligent design, I think, just fosters curiosity. And, and if you have critiques or feedback of what we said, because again, we're doing very yeah. general sort of high view look, please, please leave our, you know, comments where you can like YouTube. Um, I'm sure the different podcast yeah. sites like yeah. Spotify, Apple, um, iTunes, all of those, you can leave some sort of feedback for us because we always want to hear and discuss and think well sure. about these topics. Uh, and I would encourage you to leave more, more than a comment of like, wow, these guys are dumb or uh... heretics. <laughs> something a little bit more well thought out we got a little bit of heat on our creation, yeah, yeah, I know. creation like, podcast but it wasn't yeah, yeah. it wasn't like well thought out critiques you? or arguments okay, it was just thanks i okay whatever. yeah but i think to your point i like i, I like critiques and, well thought out <laughs> and uh intelligent so uh yes that's it okay man um we will plan on doing a podcast i think in genesis 2 genesis 3 Genesis four, Genesis five, Genesis six. I'm really mm -hmm. looking forward to that Genesis six one. So when we get there in our teaching series, we'll continue to put out these supplement, supplementary podcasts. So if you want to learn more about book book of Genesis, you can go to our website, redemptionhilldsm.org and just go to sermons and you'll get them right there. I think we had like 10 sermons in Genesis one or something like that. And again, we approach yeah. it from, yeah, it's a lot. It's a like, lot. How does he believe this? It literal six days of creation. It's like, no, I actually, we approach this from a theological perspective. It's not to say, that's not a good question to ask. God created in a literal six day, you know, six days, 24 hour days. Mm -hmm. Fine question, but actually there's so much more going on. Um, and so we approach, we approach Genesis from a theological perspective. Um, and I hope that blesses you. Uh, any final words before we close, my man? That's if No. Read your Bible, pray, read your Bible, think well. Pray, think well. Wise words from a sage man. And until next time, thanks for listening to Cornfield Theology.